Lecture 25 Of the pardon of sin under the notion of covering it. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2 Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. David is styled by some ancients the divine orifice, by whose music the wild beasts, evil men, may be made tame. And certainly his material harp was not more efficacious to drive out Saul's evil spirit than his psalms or sanctified means to expel all, corruption, all corrupt affections in us. And although all scripture be equally excellent in respect of the author, yea, and of the matter, absolutely considered, yet in respect of us, our discretion or consolation by reason of our present estate, one place of scripture may be preferred before another. In which sense... Junius interprets those psalms that have their inscription, a psalm of degrees, a psalm of excellencies, as their Hebrew word will bear it. Now this psalm I am upon may justly be so styled, because it hath a peculiar usefulness to those who are exercised about the guilt of sin. For here we have David, like an anatomy opened, that we may be instructed. Hence the title of the psalm is Maskil, which is as much as giving instruction. And it is observed by commentators, this is prefixed commonly to those psalms that have some choice, eminent doctrine, especially about afflictions, as this hath about David's guilt and trouble under sin, and also his pardon of it. The Hebrews call this psalm, this psalm, excuse me, Lev, Kor, the heart of David, because he is so affected with God's displeasure for sin and the excellency of the pardon. Therefore you must conceive the text to be uttered by David as one groaning and heavily pressed with the weight of his sin, and crying out, Oh, how blessed and happy are they who have their sins forgiven them. In which words you have pardon of sin described. First, from several expressions to magnify the mercy, sins forgiven, covered, not imputed. It is much to consider how ancient interpreters have made a difference between the sins enumerated as if there were diverse kinds, or at least degrees of sin enumerated. Hereupon also they make a difference between forgiving, covering, and imputing, as if one were more than the other. But we are rather to take it according to the scripture custom, which doth use for amplification's sake, to say the same thing in diverse words. And this is autology, not tautology. The difference is, is from the several, the difference that is, excuse me, is from several is from the several metaphors that are in the words as the first word doth signify the taking away of sin which is a burden blessed is he that is eased of such a weight the second which is covering doth suppose the loathsome filthiness of sin in the eyes of god and therefore by grace it is taken out of his sight the third not imputing or reckoning is a metaphor supposing sin a debt and god in his account will not set it upon our score so that the several expressions are wonderfully comfortable. If sin trouble thee as a heavy weight on thee, pardoning is the easing and taking off of this burden. If sin make thee to judge thyself loathsome, thou canst not endure thyself, pardon of sin is covering of it. If sin put thee in such a debt to God, that thou knowest not how to satisfy, pardon is not imputing. Secondly, this is described from the adjunct, adherent, to remission of sin, that is, blessedness. The Apostle in Romans 4 alleges this place to prove that a man hath righteousness imputed to him without works. But the pertinency of the Apostle's argument is disputed of, for how doth it from this place follow that a man hath righteousness imputed to him without works? This is as if a man should argue he is a rich man because his debts are forgiven, which is a non sequitur because they are two distinct things. This makes piscator and wanton with others to make justification to be nothing but remission of sins, and that imputation of righteousness and remission of sins are the self-same thing. A man being therefore accounted righteous because his sins are not imputed unto him. Hence they deny that the scripture ever saith, Christ's righteousness is imputed unto us, although in some sense they grant it may be said so, inasmuch as by his death for us he purchased remission of sin, which is our righteousness. This is to be considered of when we speak of the other part of justification, that is, imputation of Christ's righteousness. Although they that are for imputed righteousness say the argument is good, which Paul useth, because imputing of righteousness is immediately contrary to the imputing of sin.
And therefore, Paul might argue righteousness imputed from sin remitted. Even as we truly argue, the night is not. Therefore, the day is, because darkness and light are immediate contraries, and the subject must necessarily have one of them. Lastly, this forgiveness of sin is described from the subject in whom it is, that is, in him is whose heart there is no guile, that is, who doth not cover his sins by not confessing and not repenting of them, as David acknowledgeth he did for as while. From the text, I shall raise such observations as are to my particular scope, as first, that forgiveness of sin is a covering of sin. This truth deserveth a diligent unfolding, because the mistake about it hath brought forth dangerous errors in two extremities, the one of the papist, that because it is covered, therefore there is no sin at all in the godly, otherwise God could not but see it and hate it, as Pererius and others argue, and the other of the antinomian, who infer from thence, that therefore God seeth not sin, or taketh notice of it in justified persons, as Eden. To understand this aright, take notice that to cover is a metaphorical expression, and we must not squeeze it too much, lest blood come out instead of milk. Some make the metaphor from filthy, loathsome objects which are covered from our eyes, as dead carcasses are buried underground. Some from garments that are put upon us to cover our nakedness. Some from the Egyptians that were drowned in the Red Sea, and so covered with water. Some from a great gulf in the sea, that is filled up and covered with earth injected into it. Lastly, some make it an elusive expression to the mercy seat, over which was a covering, which might signify God's grace through and in Christ, abolishing our sins. Hence the apostle attributes hilasupthe, hilasmu, excuse me, and hilas eoi, to Christ and his blood, which is given to the mercy seed. We may not strive for any of these metaphors. They all, in the general, tend to show this, that God, when he pardoneth, doth not look upon us as sinners, but deals with us as if we had never sinned at all. As it is here made blessedness to have sin covered, so it is made a woe and misery. Nehemiah 4, verse 5. Not to have sin covered, as Nehemiah prayeth against Sanballat and Tobiah. The expression is also used in Psalm 85, verse 2. In the next place, we may consider in what sense God doth cover sin when he pardons, and in what he doth not. Number one, God is said therefore to cover sin from his eyes, because he will not take notice of it in justified persons to punish it with wrath and condemnation, although it be not so covered, as that God doth not see it to be angry with it, and chastise believers for it. Yet it is so covered as that he doth not see it to condemn believers for it. We do not therefore make God to cover sin, as an antinomian saith we do, as if a man should cover a thing with a net, where the object is still seen, honeycomb, page 57. But as to God's hatred and revengeful condemnation, so it is wholly covered. And therefore, those expressions of taking away, blotting out of sin, etc., do fully imply that God giveth not in half pardon, but that he taketh away the offense, and whatsoever punishment properly so called belongs unto it. Number two, it doth imply that God, when he hath thus forgiven, deals with a man as no more in that particular a sinner. Therefore David, after his murder and adultery, are washed away, he is as white as snow in respect of those actual sins, and every true believer repenting is bound to believe that God doth this graciously and gloriously to him, that he is no more in God's account that loathsome leper and unclean person he was. Number three, it doth imply that God by degrees and in his due time will cover the believer's sin, as from his own eyes, so from the believer's eyes, so that the guilt of conscience, those arrows of the Almighty, shall not always stick in his heart. Thus as man's love to another covers a multitude of sins, he will not mention, charge, or upbraid the party with them. So doth God's love cover the multitude of believers' sins committed by them, dealing with them as reconciled persons not upbraiding of them, but bestowing all encouraging mercies upon them, so that if we improve this phrase of covering sin no further, we shall split on no rock, and yet the soul have as much comfort as it can rationally desire. In the next place, hear what it doth not reach to, and wherein the phrase is abused, as number one, when we dream of such covering of sin, as that sin is wholly taken away, so that no relics of original corruption abide in us. Thus the papists, 
We must not, say they, suppose such a covering as if sin were still there. Only God will not impute it. But it is such a covering as is a blotting sin out. Now for actual sin, we grant covering to be a blotting out. But for original sin, in the lusts thereof, we say, they are still in the godly, and properly sins only covered, because not imputed to them. For the grace of regeneration, though it cut the hair off sin, as Delilah did Samson, yet it groweth again, as long as the root is there. Number two. We may not conceive sin covered in this sense, as if we, by our subsequent good actions, did cover sin. So some have expounded holy works to be the garment that covers our nakedness. But this would be our covering, and not God's covering, whereas the psalmist attributes it to God. Psalm 85, verse 2. Therefore that exposition will not hold, which some bring out of Austin, explaining this covering of sin, as emplastrum tegit vulnus, the grace accompany justification, yet it is not justification. Number three, we may not conceive it said to be covered in, the, in this sense, as if God, when he had pardoned, did not yet still retain anger against the person sinning, and so chastise them. Though this doctrine be much pleaded for, yet scripture is evident against it. David had sin covered, yet God would not let the sword depart from his house. Thus Job awed himself against sin with this consideration, that God would see it in him and take notice of it. Job 10, verse 14. If I sin, thou markest me, God seeth sin in Job, and thou wilt not acquit me for mine iniquity. And in Job 14, verses 16 and 17, he saith, God doth watch over his sin and seal it up in a bag. Yet not then the people of God delude themselves into security, by any false doctrine, and that woeful conclusions there are of a godly man's peace when he falls into a gross sin. I shall handle in another question. Neither fourthly may we conceive of sin covered in a carnal gross manner, as if there were something interposed between God's eyes and sin, as if a man's face were covered with a hat or a candle put under a bushel. The antinomian similitude is gross and carnal, Honeycomb, page 275. As a man looking through a red glass seeth the water all red within it, so God looking upon us in Christ seeth nothing but the righteousness of Christ and no sin at all. For the reason why our senses judge water red through a red glass is because it depends upon the fitness of a medium, and that being indisposed, the eye is deceived. But God in looking upon us doth not depend upon any intervening thing. And indeed, God's seeing of sin in this point is not so much an act of his understanding as of his will, decreeing to punish sin or not to punish it. So that this similitude doth no ways hold, for God in this manner of forgiving or punishing sin is not to be looked upon as a natural agent, but voluntarily. So that all things, excuse me, so that all these things rightly understood, we may take that which is good and comfortable, leaving that which is corrupt and false. And if the question be made, whether the phrase of covering sin make for that error, that God doth not see sin in believers offending? I answer, no, by no means, for these reasons. First, God's covering of sin is to be limited only to condemnation, as I have proved. David's sin was at the same time open to God and covered. Open to fatherly chastisements, covered to revengeful condemnation. God did see it as a father to be angry with him, not as a judge to hate him. Secondly, because this covering is limited to those sins which are past and repented of, not, new, not to new sins committed, they are not covered without a new gracious act of God's favor. David before, his, uh, excuse me, David before this sin committed that is spoken in the psalm, he had his former sins covered, but this was not covered till he did acknowledge it. And then saith he, Thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, though therefore God should not see the sins past, yet the new ones committed. They are taken notice of by him. Thirdly, because God hath covered them, yet God may and doth sometimes afflict his people for their sins, so that they cannot be in every sense said to be covered. But I have spoken largely of this already.